the Chiswick Mafia. A close-knit circle of friends Philip Schofield fell in with, in 1985, shortly after returning to Britain from his short stint in New Zealand. But, who are they? Really? The major players in the gang included former Radio 1 DJ Peter Powell and Russ Lindsay, they are the founders of James Grant Media, now called YMU Group, whose initials stand for you, me, and us. It's the very same talent agency that Philip Schofield was reportedly dropped from. YMU Group now has a staggering array of stars on its books, including Ant and Deck, Simon Cowell, David Walliams, Amanda Holden, Judge Rinder, Ryland Clark, Graham Norton, Peter Jones, Paddy McGuinness, Stacey Solomon and Joe Swash, Richard and Judy, Ruth Langsford, Ben Shepard, Claudia Winkleman, Matt Lucas, Davina McCall, Emma Willis, Tess Daly and Vernon Kay, Andy Peters, Christine Lampard, Fern Cotton, and Emily Atak, to name but a few. YMU also managed Holly Willoughby before she left in 2020 to set up her own management company. More on that later. The origins of the group, dubbed the Chiswick Mafia by Philip Schofield himself, also included Peter Powell and Russ Lindsay's then-girlfriends, and Thea Turner and the late Karen Keating, Gloria Hunniford and BBC producer Donald Keating's daughter, who was brought up in Northern Ireland, and of course Schofield himself, and they would often be seen together on nights out in Chiswick, West London in the late 80s and early 90s. Talking about his dark side during that time, the time when he was working as a children's TV presenter for the BBC, Philip Schofield said he was a lad and found it hard pretending to be such a good boy. The Chiswick Mafia were said to party hard, and even Philip himself said, it wasn't a case of hiding it. I did the same as everybody else. We partied a bit but I didn't hide anything. It's just that nobody bothered to look in the right place. We were simply getting leathered in Chiswick. Philip has also said that he favoured booze back then and in his 20s would consume large quantities on wild nights out in Chiswick with his friends. In his own words, he has even admitted to relying on bar staff to never rat him out to the press or BBC bosses. During our investigation of Philip's life in New Zealand between 1983 and 1985 for our video Schofield's Angels, Blinkerhole brought you details of how Peter Powell got in touch with Philip while he was working on TVNZ Shazam to say that he was starting a talent agency and would he be interested. It has been reported that Philip was 17 when he struck up his friendship with Powell, but the nature of exactly how they first met has, up until now, been a mystery. Blinkerhole can reveal that it was not just a chance meeting, we even have the evidence to prove it, and it comes straight from the horse's mouth. The following is an audio clip of YMU Group's original co-founder, Peter Powell, in his own words, revealing how he first came into contact with Philip Schofield. Philip Schofield, um, early days. Philip sent a, a letter to me uh, when he was just a teenager, um, and my father who was doing my fan mail at that time, God bless him. He, he sent a letter back to Philip, and Philip still got that letter from my oh. father, saying, you know, uh, Peter wishes you very best of luck in your career, whatever, whatever. And I helped him get onto the Radio 1 Roadshow when I was managing him, uh, which is still one of his most exciting moments of his life. Um, and he's a great friend and uh, a huge you know, huge asset in my life. Philip Schofield reportedly sent his first job application to the BBC when he was just 10 years old, and by the time he was 17, he had sent 100 more. Philip has admitted to typing them in an effort to disguise his age. By Peter Powell's own admission, it seems that it was not just job applications he was typing, it was letters too, and we can't help but wonder, who else besides Peter Powell? pictured here in 1978, that Philip may have contacted at the BBC via typed letter, in those early days. Powell soon became Philip Schofield's agent and the Chiswick Mafia was born. During the late 80s, Philip was batting off his female admirers with the excuse that he was still in love with Fenella Bathfield, a dancer he met in New Zealand, whom we spoke about in our last video. Philip is said to have continued for six years to say that he was still in a relationship with Fenella during the time he was in the broom cupboard, with Gordon the gopher, and, Fenella was livid. By this time she was engaged to someone else and was tired of Philip saying they were still in a relationship. She said, it may enhance his reputation and make him look like a big stud in Britain but I don't want to be the punch bag anymore. I don't think there's any excuse for him saying we still see each other. I want him to put a stop to it. 
there hasn't been anything wonderful between us for quite a while. Schofield was then romantically linked to Karen Keating, having apparently fallen for her when he saw her introduced as a new presenter on the BBC's Blue Peter. Philip wrote, One afternoon, as I was sitting in the booth and watching Blue Peter, a new presenter was introduced. I sat up. Karen Keating was welcomed to the team. I was instantly entranced and set about orchestrating a meeting. We had a few drinks and ended up going out for a while. How to describe Karen? Beautiful, artistic, stubborn, wild, unpredictable and one of the world's greatest party animals. Reflecting on their time together, Philip said, Karen would leave a black tie event and insist she knew a shortcut out. 30 minutes later, would be lost in the kitchens of the Grosvenor house and sitting with the staff, drinking whiskey. If I went out with her for a romantic meal, by the end, we would be sharing our table with 30 drunken revelers and someone would have invariably found a fiddle to play. It was fun and brilliantly chaotic, but not easy to understand. Philip and Karen soon parted as in Schofield's words, the very best of friends. Step forward Philip's Chiswick Mafia buddy and other co-founder of the original YMU group, James Grant Media, Russ Lindsay, who is said to have asked if it would break the lad's code if he was to ask Karen out. Russ and Karen then went on to marry in 1991 and had two boys, before she tragically died of cancer in 2004, aged 41. A year later, Russ Lindsay proposed to Sally Mean and married her the following year in 2006. Chiswick Mafia members were in attendance as they tied the knot at a 400-year-old country house hotel in Surrey, and Thea Turner was Sally's maid of honor and her then-husband, Peter Powell was Russ's best man. Karen Keating's former flame, Philip Schofield and wife Stephanie Lowe, Anton Deck and Richard and Judy were also guests at the wedding, however, the mother of Russ's late wife Karen Keating, grandmother to Russ and Karen's children, Gloria Hunniford who once said she loved Russ like a third son, was noticeably absent. Bride, Sally Mean, who was once a dancer on Benny Hill, was incidentally, the person responsible for introducing Ruth Langsford to Eamon Holmes and both to James Grant Media. Sally is said to have introduced them in London, while Amon was a GMTV host, two years after Amon had split from his first wife, Gabrielle Holmes. It has also been reported that Sally Mean and Karen Keating, her new husband's late wife, had known each other for a number of years through mutual friends and had met Russ on occasion during that time. Sally, who was also once a hostess on the BBC's Jim Davidson's Generation Game, had even attended Karen's funeral two years earlier. Her romance with Karen's widower was said to have blossomed at a barbecue, at the house he shared with Karen and their two children in Foy, Cornwall, five months after Karen passed away. Karen's mother, Gloria Hunniford gave a number of interviews at the time in which she spoke about her devastation at Karen's death and a year later, she wrote a book, Next to You, about Karen and the anguish of losing her. There were suggestions at the time that Gloria was uneasy about the speed with which Russ had met a new partner. Russ's new wife, Sally Mean, though, stated, Russ and I were trying to start a relationship which some people were against. It was written in the media that Karen and I had been best mates, but we weren't. The opposition to us being together actually forced our hand. We had to decide whether we were in or out, so we chose to be in. It was said at the outset, things progressed slowly. For a few months, Sally and Russ spoke regularly on the phone, and Sally drove to Cornwall every other weekend. Sally, in her own words, said, it was separate bedrooms, I was really a companion for daddy. And, talking of Russ's proposal on Christmas Day, she said, I had a load of sausage meat in my hand and Russ came in, got down on one knee and said, I'm madly in love with you, will you do me the honor of becoming my wife, and presented me with a ring. Meanwhile, rewinding back to the early 90s, another Chiswick Mafia member, Philip Schofield, was romantically adrift without Fenella Bathfield and Karen Keating to fall back on, and when Peter Powell married and Thea Turner in 1990, Schofield called it the final straw, remarking that Powell was the very last bastion of bachelorhood, and that he was now looking for a life partner himself. But we have noticed by that stage Philip had already met his current wife, Stephanie Lowe in 1988, after fellow BBC children's presenter, Andy Crane had introduced them at a party. Andy Crane, that very same year, 1988, funnily enough was presenting Top of the Pops alongside Peter Powell. 
And then, in 1992, it was Peter Powell, Schofield's agent that suggested to Philip that he should follow Neighbours star Jason Donovan on stage as the lead in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat and Philip left his job on BBC Radio 1, and as we know, he did just that. The following year Philip Schofield married Stephanie Lowe. A few years later, in 1998, Peter Powell and Anthea Turner, divorced due to her extramarital affair with Powell's friend Grant Bovey, yet Powell stayed on the payroll as her agent for another 14 years. Pictured leaving their mansion in Twickenham, southwest London, shortly after the scandal, Peter Powell was said to have been happy to forgive and forget after Anthea told him of the affair. A pal of Powell's said, for a time, he hoped Anthea had just had a terrible rush of blood to the head and it was only a fling. Now he knows that she's not coming back, he's ready to start over again. He's cut up about it all, but he's a fighter. Powell and Anthea even continued to live in the same house together, with Powell holding off putting the house up for sale until Anthea had finalized her new living arrangements. Anthea later said of Powell, Growing up, my dad sorted things out like insurance and cars, then I always had what I would call capable boyfriends, including my first husband, Peter Powell. He was my manager, a fixer and a sorter. Anthea went on to marry Grant Bovey in 2000, but they split when she found him out in a lie. Up pops Sally Mean again, Russ Lindsay's wife who had called Anthea to tell her that Michael Keating, Karen Keating's brother was not with Grant as she had thought. It was said to be the moment that Anthea twigged that hubby Bovey had been having an affair with Zoe de Mallet Morgan, the 24-year-old daughter of an estate agent, while Anthea was working in Canada. Anthea then turned to her ex-husband Peter Powell, her old Chiswick Mafia mate for support. Anthea is pictured here with Russ Lindsay on Peter Powell's yacht, shortly after taking up her ex-hubby's offer of a getaway to give herself time to think. And Piers Morgan, who has also been one of Peter Powell's successful so-called golden handcuffs signings, once heaped praise on Powell, who was named as the most powerful person in television by The Guardian in 2009. Pierce said that Peter Powell very much sails under the radar and that he is a quiet, dignified sort of a person who has got to where he is with hard work. Pierce also said of Powell, it's pretty amazing when he visits Britain's Got Talent and goes from dressing room to dressing room because they are all on his books, with the exception of Amanda. Today though she is signed to YMU Group. Piers Morgan continued, I talk to Peter most days. He's quite paternal in that respect. He's a very loyal guy. He's cool and he's also thrilled by your success. We all love and respect him. And, disgraced PR Supremo, the late Max Clifford, a former business associate of Powell's, said of him, Peter's a courteous guy and he's dedicated his whole life to his clients and obviously they appreciate that. With Peter, pretty much, what you see is what you get. Having been a performer himself, he understands the worries and the insecurities, the sort of things that go through artists' minds, and that has given him the edge. People think these stars are supremely confident, but they are not. Max Clifford incidentally, used to look after Simon Cowell's press, before Cowell ditched him in 2014, two years after Clifford's conviction on eight counts of indecent assault. Simon, at the time, was said to be horrified by Clifford's attacks on young women. Talking about Powell's signing of Simon Cowell, Max Clifford once said, once you're in that position, you're in a situation where you can create opportunities for them. It puts you at the center. For example, looking after Simon, the hottest thing in television worldwide, that gives you huge opportunities. Asked about the subject of Peter Powell's virtual monopoly on ITV talent, Max Clifford had said, of course, there's envy. Every PR in the world is envious of me. I know that. It's an obvious thing, because Peter's so successful, but I think the key to it is Simon Cowell. Who's the one who has got the big programs? If you've got them, in terms of dealing with ITV, or Fox Television in America, and if Simon wants it, and you're representing Simon, there isn't a problem. So what about now? Could it just be the old footsteps of the Chiswick Mafia echoing around the streets of West London or could what started out as a small talent agency named using Peter Powell and Russ Lintz's middle names all those years ago, have evolved into something much, much bigger? YMU's group's range of services which we found on a former worker's LinkedIn, appear to include crisis management, reputation positioning and upholding the highest levels of trust and confidentiality. Now notably absent in YMU's long list of high-profile clients, though, are Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby, 
However, Schofield's daughter Molly still works there as a talent manager, as does Richard and Judy's son Jack who is also a talent manager, at YMU. Martha Atak is also on their payroll, Emily Atak's sister. In 2020 Philip Schofield moved back to where it all began for the Chiswick Mafia, Chiswick, which was, once upon a time a fishing village, but now an affluent area with plenty of green spaces and chock-a-block with celebrities. Schofield's Chiswick neighbors said at the time that they had regularly seen Schofield around the area, and that he had also been frequenting pubs along the River Thames. One local said, there's quite a few famous people already living around here, so Philip Schofield moving in is not a big deal. A lot of people have been talking about it, but nobody bothers him. Philip's two-bedroom semi-detached Chiswick property is just a stone's throw from Declan Donnelly's home and Aunt McPartland's former home he shared with Lisa Armstrong. In an article by The Mirror in 2018, the link to it is in the description, the headline reads, Aunt McPartland's new girlfriend. Inside incestuous showbiz agency, that match makes its stars. As he moves on with assistant. The article states that Declan Donnelly spent years looking for the one before marrying his manager Alia Stahl in 2015, cementing his family-friendly image. It also states that Aunt McPartland split from wife Lisa Armstrong, entered rehab twice, then got with his personal assistant Anne-Marie Corbett. Alia Stahl works for YMU Group and Anne-Marie Corbett worked for James Grant Media. According to the Daily Mail's Alison Boshoff, sometimes the group's pairings mix business and pleasure. She writes, surprising as it may sound to those unfamiliar with show business, matchmaking is often conducted under the James Grant auspices, and sometimes blends romantic attraction with sound business sense. The group is so tight and savvy that its stars shun after parties in favor of heading back to each other's houses, away from prying eyes. They even holiday together with Phil having bought an escape in the Algarve just down the road from Ant and Dex holiday homes in the same gated resort. And a source told the newspaper, it's the tightest and most successful clique in the business, while one former member said, we considered each other family, it was as simple as that. James Grant signed Ant and Deck back in their SMTV Live days when they were fresh off the boy band wagon, and explaining the kind of talent they look for, Peter Powell once said, we go for young people with a good clean image and bags of potential. We spotted 10 years ago this would become a big market. Things were moving away from bad girls with tattoos and an attitude problem. Meanwhile, Anne-Marie Corbett is believed to have worked for the firm for 10 years and Anne's estranged wife Lisa appears to have been mates with her for some time, giving her a shout-out in 2014 as the pair watched Ant on I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here Together with Wine. And she tweeted her on her 40th birthday, writing, Happy birthday to my gorgeous friend, congratulations on your 40th, hope you've been spoilt rotten, while I know you have. In an angry tweet, she said Anne-Marie had been both hers and Ant's PA, tweeting, and to think she was my friend. Chiswick Mafia member Russ Lindsay exited James Grant in 2015 to create Infinity Creative Media, a television production business and he also co-founded Talent Bank, which is described as a creative conduit between talent and the world's most sophisticated digital broadcast platforms. Russ is still married to Sally Mean and they have two daughters together along with Russ's two sons with Karen Keating. When the news eventually broke that Philip Schofield lied about his, in his words an unwise but not illegal affair, it seems rather implausible that the relationship had passed showbiz journalists by, after all, the story had been circulating widely on social media for years. So why was it only published in the tabloids in 2023? Well, YMU is the closest thing that primetime TV presenters have to a union. With so many big hitters all in the same stable, they have immense collective bargaining power, a power that manifests itself in many different ways. It's been said that YMU will make an A-list star of theirs available to a project only on the condition that producers also take a few of their lesser exposed clients too. This sort of package deal is a common agency trick called multipacking and is not confined to YMU and it's the reason why we always see the same old faces paired up together on panel shows, podcasts, talent contests and so on. The area in which YMU stands alone, however, is tabloid media management. YMU are said to be notorious in the industry for their threats to cut off access to the rest of their roster. Whenever an unflattering story about one of their clients is poised to break, the journalists presiding over it will find themselves faced with the prospect of being blacklisted by YMU. If one of their clients gets caught out doing something dicey, 
journalists are required to approach them for comment. This is when the agency kicks into action, threatening to deny the reporter's entire outlet access to their other clients' work. That means no Britain's Got Talent scoops, no I'm a Celebrity scoops, no Strictly Come Dancing scoops, no This Morning or Dancing on Ice scoops, all shows that are the lifeblood of tabloid showbiz columns. One would think that the bigger, more powerful media organizations would be able to face up to this sort of threat but, as it turns out, they are the ones this threat bites the hardest. Sister papers get frozen out. Sunday supplements get snubbed. If someone wants a YMU client to appear on the radio or TV channel, or if they want to do a book with them, well, it appears that they can forget it. Every last division gets its plug pulled. So editors have a choice. One explosive story for six months in the sin bin. Or, trade that scoop in for lots of happier, softer, client-approved material that fills many more pages, week after week, making everyone's lives much easier. Unless, they're Philip Schofield. He was said to have been encouraged by YMU's literary division to write his autobiography, Life's What You Make It, to capitalize on the goodwill extended towards him after coming out on this morning in 2020. And, when Phil and Holly were accused of using their celebrity status to queue jump in order to see the late Queen Elizabeth's coffin, they appeared to be both culpable in the scandal, but the focus leaned more towards Holly. In this article, one of many, it states that Holly Willoughby was battling for her this morning job amid claims she skipped the Queen's lying in state queue. A petition for her to go was gaining momentum despite an on-air apology. Holly called in lawyers. The only mention of Philip Schofield on the entire front page is the picture caption, identifying him solely as her co-star. So why did Holly get thrown under the bus for Phil? The Sun had generously been given the scoop of his big coming out reveal ahead of time, so perhaps that had something to do with it, but part of the answer may lie in a smaller article published two months earlier. Holly Willoughby left YMU in 2020, a few months after Philip's decision to come out. But she didn't just move to a rival, she became a rival, setting up her own talent agency. Her extraction from the agency did not go smoothly. In fact, it resulted in a years-long million-pound lawsuit that was settled, in Holly's favor, in early July 2022, two months before QGate broke. Had she still been in the YMU fold, it's highly likely they'd have made every effort to protect their client and keep her out of the firing line the way they managed with Phil and his part in the queue jumping. However, she'd gone into competition with them and rinsed them for a seven-figure sum, so it could be said that they were feeling a lot less charitable. And so, Holly became the face of Q-Gate. It was also perhaps a warning to other clients who may have dared to follow Holly out of the door. But it's been said that YMU has a much more effective way of keeping their stars loyal, they make a habit of hiring husband and wife teams, knowing that one won't leave without the other unless they suddenly want their spouse's work to dry up. That's why you see Emma Willis and Matt Willis, Tess Daly and Vernon Kay, Richard and Judy, Stacey Solomon and Joe Swash etc. on their books. So it appears that the mystery source was correct when they told the Daily Mail we considered each other family, it was as simple as that. However, sometimes, something explodes, like the Philip Schofield scandal, which toppled dominoes throughout the entire ITV hierarchy, and it made the fallout all the more complicated. A lesson Philip Schofield has recently learned. Back in his heyday though, things were decidedly different for him. One of the most fascinating stories to come out of Schofield's 2020 book life is what you make it, Philip shares a glimpse of those good old days when he was safely nesting under Peter Powell's wing, telling of the time he was caught speeding on the M1 motorway. He does not give a date for the incident but it happened during his Radio 1 days, when the Chiswick Mafia were living it up in West London in the late 80s, early 90s. Around that time, Philip joined forces with Northumberland Police to help them promote a new public outreach campaign. The following is an excerpt from Philip Schofield's book about the incident which happened on the way to the launch of the campaign, told in his own words. I traveled to the launch and was happy to take part. A few days later, I was caught speeding on the M1. Not excessively, but enough. The James Grant office called to warn the chief superintendent in Northumberland that this had happened and that we were sorry if this had caused any embarrassment. He surprised us by saying he would look into it. A week or so later I got a letter from the police in Hendon, where the speeding offence had happened. 
the chief inspector told me that in light of the fact that I was currently working with the police, and to prevent embarrassment, he would on this one occasion overlook the offence. However, if my name ever crossed his desk again, in brackets Philip writes, it never has, he would without question come down on me in the fullest way possible. I wrote your pee on the letter and drew a car with speed lines around it and the room coming out of the exhaust. I drove to the office to tell Russ and Paul. They were both out. My intention was to copy the letter once and place the copy on Russ's desk. I accidentally made 10 copies. I stabbed at the copier in a frantic attempt to make it stop, but it wouldn't. I left one copy on Russ's desk, put the remaining 9 copies in my bag and went to work at Radio 1. Unfortunately for Philip, his studio at Radio 1 was burgled that same night and the thief made off with a number of employees' wallets and bags, including Philip's, with the nine annotated copies of the letter Hendon police had sent. Philip then sheepishly fessed up to his fellow Chiswick Mafia gang members Peter Powell and Russ Lindsay, aka James Grant, who Philip says, were becoming increasingly adept at putting out media fires, and they took care of it. Six months later, a third police force got involved. Officers from Chiswick Police knocked on Philip's door to let him know that they had apprehended the Radio 1 thief and had his bag to return. Most of his belongings were still present, except for his wallet and one of the EP Varum letters. He could only count eight. The officers explained that they had taken one of them. It was pinned to their office notice board. The most interesting aspect of this charming tale of chumminess between celebrity and copper, is that the public outreach campaign that Philip Schofield had originally been selected to front for Northumberland Police was to encourage young people to come forward to adults if they ever felt anything was wrong. And, also ironic is the fact that several years later, Philip Schofield visited youngsters at a school to give out awards to children who created speeding awareness posters as part of a road safety campaign. An article by the Bucks Free Press dated the 9th of June 2009, states that Schofield was accompanied at the school by a WPC and a PCSO from Thames Valley Police. Philip said at the time, the standard was really good and it was easy to judge because they stood out really quickly. I have had hundreds of entries scattered across my kitchen table in the last couple of weeks. Even the tiny ones had grasped the message and understood and the posters were really graphic. It's certainly a 21st century look at road safety. The article then goes on to list the winners from nearby nursery and primary schools. The children's ages ranged from 4 to 11 years old. All the winning pupils attended the school to pick up their prizes from the man himself, Philip Schofield. It was Peter Powell who That's right, um, yeah. took that jingle as his own. And yeah. so it was always summer radio on the Peter Powell show. And it was it for, for me listening to the radio then as just a listener, that was the start of the summer when Pete played that jingle. Summer radio on the beach. And let's go for it. Please like and subscribe for more journeys through the blinker hole. For entertainment purposes only.